Okay. Welcome back to our second lecture, BC 1113. The second lecture today, we're going to get started. So, what we completed in the previous answers, you're fine. Okay. All right. Um, what we completed in the previous lecture, that's the first six, is um, the steps of the faith of Abraham. So, we just went through that. So, this is how Abraham exercised faith. Now we're going to go into our next lesson, lesson number seven. Let me share the notes. I want to talk a little bit about faith, hope, and love, and the interaction between these faith, hope, and love. You know, all three are important. Uh, as for this, the 13th chapter, 13th verse, you know. Now the main is faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. I'll just start. But there are three things that now remain. It means that we have to walk in as believers. Faith, hope, and love. So I just want to talk a few things here, talk about different thoughts and insights on this. So faith, I mean, first when you look at faith and hope, and we've emphasized a little bit of this in uh, the previous lecture, Faith and hope are interrelated. They're connected. They're important. Hope is where it starts. And we have to have hope first. Because faith is the substance of things. Hope. So the hope is the expectation. A desire to have something. Expectation. So the hope is important. We have to be hopeful. We have to have hope. And hope is an expectation and is in the it is in the future. I hope I will to get it. I hope to become. I hope to be there. I hope to achieve. It's 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 something that we are expecting out in the future in our lives. So but faith is what brings that hope from a place of expectation into a place of possession. Unless you have it, it brings it into your experience. But hope is in order because when we start out with hope, we start out having hope. So for example, you know, if there's a person who's sick, doctors have said, you know, I can't be done with anything. The person must have hope that I'm going to get better. And then they extend faith to bring that hope into their experience. So hope is important. You shouldn't give up. If you lose hope, then faith can't be exercised. If you don't have hope, then faith cannot be exercised. Because faith is a substance of things. Hope is important. So hope and faith are very, they go together. They're important. Now, some things about hope uh, we see in scripture in Hebrews 6, verse 19. Uh, if you talk about it in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19, uh, this verse actually brings out two important things about hope. Hebrews 6, verse 19. It says here, Hebrews 6, 19. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered us, Jesus. So telling us two things about hope. This hope is an anchor of the soul. So hope is very important. Why? It, 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 it's like an anchor. It stabilizes, keeps us 
stable anchor. So the picture is of the anchor used in a ship, by a ship, in the middle of the stormy sea. So when, when, uh, when there's a storm at sea, what do they do? They drop anchor. So they drop this heavy thing that goes down in the, the bed of the ocean. And then it stabilizes the ship in the middle of the storm until the storm comes out and they lift anchor and they keep moving. So hope is like that. It's an anchor. It stabilizes us. So hope is an anchor for that. So a mind most stabilizes. But it also tells us one more thing in Hebrew 6.19. It says this hope enters the presence behind the veil. That means it, our hope connects us to Jesus. No, it's talking about the presence behind the veil, that is Jesus. It's talking about Jesus, the one who has gone into the heavens. So our hope actually anchors us in the Lord, in Jesus Christ. And so hope is important. It anchors us. But it also it anchors us in the person of Christ in Jesus. So hope is important. Now we mentioned earlier in the previous lecture, I will kind of repeat this uh, from Genesis 15 that uh, it's important to paint a picture of hope in our mind based on the promise of God. Okay. So we learn from Genesis 15 uh, how Abraham was getting doubtful whether the God meant a child from his own body. So he's asking about Lord, you know, is it somebody else who's born in the house? And God tells Abraham, no, no, no. Someone was born of you. That's what I meant. And then God tells Abraham to come out of this tent and look up at the night sky and says, Abraham, that's how many your descendants will be. And so that picture stayed in Abraham's mind, which enabled him to continue to be hopeful and continue to believe in God. So based on that, we're just you know, drawing a simple deduction or insight that we need to keep a picture of hope in our minds, keep that picture of the promise of God fulfilled and in your mind, and that will help you keep your hope alive, to stay in of hope. So hope is important. And then when we have hope, then faith comes in. If you have hope makes faith alive, faith comes in, and faith brings that which we hope for into our possession. Faith is a substance of things hope. On a slightly different note, I'll take a few moments to talk about faith versus feelings. Second Corinthians 5 verse 7 says, we walk by faith and not by sight. So get Corinthians 5 verse 7. That means our walk of our walk of faith, it's not dictated, it's not determined by our physical senses, by our sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. So that's how we walk as believers. That means my faith is more important. It overrides my physical senses. So my physical senses may say things, tell me things about facts. This is what's happening once and all. But my faith is superior to that. It's overriding that. I'm not denying the facts. I'm recognizing the evidence. That's a fact. But like Abraham, he saw Abraham. He considered not his own body. So he walked by faith and not by sense. He's not denying the fact that he was 100 years old, Sarah was 90. Not the next one, that's, that's a fact. Yeah, we are old. Sarah and Grant, we put the facts. Those are that, that's what our senses are telling us. Fine. But there's something beyond that. Faith. And our faith locks us into God, into his promise, and by faith 
been able to walk from above our feelings. A good example of this is in John chapter 20, verses 24 to 29. If you turn to the Bible, it's John 20, 24 to 29. And I'll just narrate this for us. This is after Christ's resurrection. And what is interesting is that the disciples of Jesus, at one point after the resurrection, but actually unbelieving. I mean, they didn't really believe. Like, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Because they saw him crucified. They saw how he was nailed. They saw him die on the cross. And they saw, they know that his body had been buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arbitia. They knew that. So maybe the minds of many of the disciples, story is over. This is over. Is the end. They were not believing until you know on, 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 on resurrection Sunday. You know, one by one, the news started coming. And Mary said, I saw Jesus, Peter and John, hey, the tomb is empty. Uh, but the others are like, Are you sure you went to that? You know, are you sure? Are you sure? They're still not, it's taking time for them to accept, even for the disciples. And one of them, Thomas. Today, guys, don't tell me stories until I see him, until I put my hands. The Thomas is becoming very, very like you guys can't tell me until I see him, until I put my hand in his, you know, his wounds. I won't believe him. So, Thomas. Is basing his faith on what he can, what he would see and touch and feel. He's basing his faith on that. So we call that kind of faith as, you know, uh, natural faith or sense knowledge faith. Faith that is based on feelings, on what you can. For example, this is a chair right here. We have no problems coming in, you know, anybody sitting on the chair. Why? Because, uh, you know, you don't, you don't expect the chair to suddenly go down to the ground. No. Why? Because sense knowledge it means, you know, in your mind, this chair is strong enough to carry my weight so I can just sit comfortably. And that is natural faith. It's based on some understanding, some logic, some fact. This chair is strong enough to bear my weight, so I will just sit on it. I am not hesitant. Now, that is not Bible faith. That is natural faith. Anybody has it? Any person can have it. That's it. It's not what we call it sense knowledge faith. Faith based on practical faith. It's faith based on our senses, what we see, what we feel, what we know. Now, Thomas is putting himself in that category. I will have faith, but this kind of faith, natural faith, sense knowledge faith, I have to see, I have to touch, only then I will believe. Now, we know what happens. He is gay. So Thomas. Oh, so Lord, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then Jesus, at that time, Jesus says, Thomas, you have believed because you have seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. So this is a different kind of It is believing. Even when you have not seen, that means you're believing independent of your senses. You haven't seen, but you still believe. That's the kind, that's Bible faith. That's the kind of thing that Jesus says is blessed. Blessed are those 
I'm not seeing what hand. So that is the kind of thing where he says we walk by faith, not by sin. And that's Bible faith. That is not natural faith. That's believing God because of what he has told you, believing God because of who he is, and he's true, he's faithful to his word, God cannot lie, his promises are sure, he will keep his covenant. So that's believing God. Not because of your sins, but because of who God is. So, faith and feelings. A little comment on that. That we have to learn to walk by faith, independent of feeling. Now, sometimes your feelings may agree with your faith. They, you know, feel that's nice. It's okay. And there'll be times when your feelings are opposite to your faith, or they don't support your faith. I fully remember Jesus said, "Blessed are those who have not seen yet have believed." We walk by faith, not by so sometimes my senses may be opposite to my faith, but I still walk by That's my good faith. Another thing we can talk about is also faith versus doubt. We have mentioned this before. But the point I want to just emphasize here. about or differentiate is, differentiate is doubt in our mind versus doubt in our heart. In Mark 11, 23, Mark 11, verses 22 and 23, Jesus said, have faith in God. And then he said, verse 23, whoever says to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, and there's no doubt in his heart but believes in those things he says will be done he will have whatever he said so where must i not doubt don't doubt in your heart i mean that's where actual believing takes place so he says don't doubt in your heart no there can be doubts in our minds. Because our mind, which is that part of us which connects to the natural world, uh, is very logical. It goes by logic, it goes by feelings, it goes by the natural senses. And so many times our mind will say, hey, how is it going to happen? Oh, it doesn't look like Or oh, look at the situation. Look at the circumstances. That's our mind at work. Right? It connects us to the natural world. So obviously, it's thinking along those lines. But having doubts in your mind is not the same thing as having doubt in your heart. Or let me put it like this. Maybe there are doubts in your mind, but you can still believe in your heart. There may be doubts in your mind. But you can still believe in your heart. Because your mind is working like that. That's the way the mind works. It looks at the circumstance, it looks at the situation, uh, and, and the mind is thinking, hmm, how is this going to happen? You know, it's processing natural information. So don't confuse the thoughts of your mind as though it was doubt in your your heart can still be settled in the word of God, in who God is, although in your mind you really don't have the answer. In your mind, you really don't have, you don't have you haven't figured it out in your mind. It's okay. There are many things we don't can't figure out in our minds. You know, we will not be able to describe how great God is, all of us. Our minds are small, ununderstandable, but it can believe in God. My heart. I can believe that God can bring God is mighty God, powerful God. I can believe this. So okay. 
hundred seconds. Very simple thing. Very important. You can have faith in your heart, even if there are doubts coming in your mind. Is it clear? Yes or no? Okay. You're with me so far, right? So don't confuse that. Just because you have some doubts in your mind. Okay, I don't have I don't have the answers to those questions. Yeah. But I still believe in my heart. I believe because of the word of God, because of who God is, because He has spoken to me by the Spirit, so I can believe. You know, and that's how I, I, I'm just making a side note here, and that's how the gifts of the Holy Spirit also operate. So when we tell you, okay, here's the, you know, here's step out of the word of knowledge, step out of the prophecy. You know, many times your mind is going to be saying, hey, you're, you're really crazy. How can you say this? How can you say that? But in your heart, you know you heard from God. God has spoken. Your mind is questioning. How would you know that? Is that right? Is that you're going to make a fool of yourself? How can you? But in your heart, you know, I've heard from God. God has spoken. So what do you do? You go with what your heart does. You step out and read the word of knowledge. You speak that word of prophecy. You minister. Yeah. So really, even flowing from the gift of the Holy Spirit is a step of faith, even though many times your mind is questioning. We you know when God has spoken. God has spoken. So then you can release that word of knowledge of the gift of the Spirit. Okay. So we we'll talk about that during the supernatural armor afterwards. Now, continuing on the same thing, faith, hope, and love. We know. That the Bible teaches us the greatest is love. The greatest is love. And it's love must be kept as the most important thing. And look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. Galatians 5, verse 6. Galatians 5, verse 6 says, Does failing works? My love, Galatians 5 verse 6. A lot of part of that verse, it says, What really matters is faith working through love. How does faith work? It works through love. The so love is very important. Now, okay? He said, Faith, hope, and love. He saw faith and hope, both are important. Now we talk about faith and love. Faith works through love. So it means if I don't have love, faith won't work. If you don't have love, faith won't. Because faith works through. So the first thing I must seek to have in my heart is I must seek to love the person, love the people, walk in love. Because faith works through. So if I, if I want to minister to people, I must first have love for them, have compassion for them. Then faith comes in to what to serve the people, minister to the people. So understand the importance now. Faith works through love. So love is important. If, it, if there's no love, faith can't work. So that's why in First Corinthians chapter 13, the Apostle Paul, uh, this is actually the chapter in which he's talking about the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, chapter 12, 13, 14. And in uh, chapter 13, he's emphasizing a lot. The whole context there is about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, chapter 12, the reprobation. And while he's talking about it, he says, you know, look, 
If I claim to have faith, I could move mountains. This is First Corinthians 13. And uh, yeah. verse 2, the second half of verse 2. It says, though I have all faith that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am the thing. Just like, I, I could say I have all faith. It's great faith. But if I don't have love, I'm not loving the people. There's an amount for me. I can't produce nothing. I'm unproductive. My faith is unproductive. Useless. So, first, love the walk in love. Then, faith comes in. Faith hope. They are important. They will come in. And so, love motivates faith. So, then, love motivates faith. Motivates faith. I should believe God for your own life. Believe God for people around you. To believe God for you know, the things that God all you know, calls us to do. Remember, our, 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 it's love that must motivate our faith. Love motivates our faith. It moves us into action. That's the emphasis there in First Corinthians chapter 13. Okay. Uh, so there's a little explanation here on, on what the love of God is. Skipping that. Now, let's go to First Timothy chapter one verse five. First Timothy chapter one verse five. You see another combination of our attitudes that are presented here in First Timothy chapter one verse five. The Apostle Paul writes. He says. The purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. So notice he's talking about several different things. He's saying love, pure heart, good conscience, and sincere faith. So uh, we need to maintain the, all of these things together. Right? So we're while our focus in this course is on faith, there are all these other things that are important. Love, pure heart, good conscience, or a clear conscience, and sincere faith. Faith must be sincere. I'm not doing it all. I'm not trying to believe God for wrong things, wrong reasons, wrong motivations. But sincere faith comes from pure heart and good conscience. And so it's okay. Okay, so those are a, a few side comments here. We're going to go into chapter eight. I'll just start start off chapter eight. Make a few things. Now, what we want to do in chapter eight is give an overview of how faith uh, is or the, the role that faith plays in the life of the believer. Different areas, right? And some of those are very familiar, so I'm not going to spend necessarily explaining everything. I'm spend too much time explaining it, but just for completeness' sake, we'll, we'll itemize these things. We will listen these things up to us. So, chapter eight: the believers walk with faith. We all know that we are saved by grace through. That means salvation has been extended to us by God's grace. But we receive it by faith. So our side, faith in God. God's side, by grace, He gives us the free gift of salvation. So we know the scripture, Ephesians 3 to 9, we are saved by grace through faith. Secondly, in the life of the believer, everything must be done in faith. Whatever you're called to do, whatever you're called to do, do it by faith. So we live by faith. It means that in all matters, you know, in, in your heart or in our hearts, there is faith in God. I believe, for example, when you're going to eat your food, God, I thank you for blessed. It's blessed for my body. Um, we're going out, God, I thank you. You protect me. You keep me safe. 
So everything, every aspect, every aspect of life, we are living by faith in God. So we walk by faith, we live by faith, and we are, you know, we, we are trusting God as for God has spoken to us uh, in every aspect of our lives. We live by faith. And the Bible tells us whatever is not of faith is sin. I think about that. And also in Romans 14, he's talking about food you eat. Um, uh, and he's saying, okay, if you eat, you eat it in faith. For whatever is not from faith is. If you're not really walking by faith, you're not doing this with faith, then you can't with sin. Because it puts us in a place of distrust or unbelief in God. So everything we do, we do by faith. Now let me look at point number three. Yeah. Why is what what role does faith play in the life of the believer? Number three. Faith is key to receiving from God. I'm gonna we're gonna spend some time on this. Faith is key to receiving from God. You see the problem with many of us. Is that when it comes to receiving from God, we think, well, if God wants me to have it, I'll have it. Or he'll just give it to me. But the Bible is telling us something different. The Bible is saying, I need to actively have faith in God in order to receive. And we see that. In James chapter 1, verses 5 to 7. So look, look at it very carefully. Verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Well, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Now look at those verses very carefully. What does he start talking about? If any of you lack what? Wisdom. So he says, if you lack wisdom. But what does he end up talking about? Anything. So these verses are telling us not only how to receive wisdom, but it's telling us this is the same thing you do if you want to receive anything from God. Same thing. So the next thing is, he says, think about God. What about God? He says, God is a giving God. God is a giving God. He gives. And he gives to all. How many people? He gives to all. And how does he give? He gives liberally or generously. And without reproach. That means he doesn't scold you. Uh, why are you coming asking me? Without reproach. So, the second thing we see here is this. He's telling us about God. He says, see, God is not a stingy God. No. God is a God who gives. He's a generous God. And he gives to all. So nobody can say, oh, God gives only to so and so, it doesn't give me. No, he gives to all. And he gives liberally, generously. Liberal. He's, he's, he's very lavish, liberal in giving. And he gives without scolding. So, the problem is not with God. If I don't receive, the problem is not with God. Are you understand? If any of you lack, something 
you're going to God. God is a good girl. He's a generous girl. He's fair to everybody. He's generous to everybody. He doesn't scold you. So no problem on his legs. He's ready to give. But let him ask in faith. So that is the condition. Let him ask in faith with no doubt. So there is no problem with God. Don't blame God. Oh, Bob didn't want me to have it. No. God is a generous God. He's just everybody. He's people liberally. So don't put the blame on God. The criteria is, or the requirement of it is, let him ask in without any doubt. So that's how we are saying in the life of the believer. Faith is key to receiving from and not only wisdom, because he says if you lack wisdom, but then he says if you want to receive anything from the Lord, anything from the Lord, this is how you do it. Anything. Ask in faith with no how do I know I'm doubting or what is this about doubting? A person who doubts, he says, it's like the wave of the sea. This side, next, that side. This side, that's it. Wave of the sea, driven in thoughts. One time he says, yes, yes, yes. One time he says, no, 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 no. Or oh, he's, he's going, he's oscillating or vacillating from one end to the other. This is that's thing a person who doubts. He doubts, he's driven by the bend in commerce. And if I am like that, ah, then he says, no, I will not receive anything. So, our failure to receive from God. Is not God's. Our failure to receive from God is not. It's not something that God didn't want me to have it. He sometimes we pray, we don't receive, and then say maybe God didn't want me to have it. That's the usual, you know, uh, conclusion or usual comment we hear. When we, when we don't receive from maybe it was not God's will. Maybe God didn't want you to have it. But James is not telling that to us. He is saying God gives all liberally without reproach. The problem, the reason why we didn't receive is because we were tossed, we were doubtful, we were like this way the wind and Will not be seen. Okay. Now, I do understand the importance of the will of God. We will talk about it in the number of prayer. There is this aspect of God's will. But when we know the word of God, that is the will of God. So if it is in the word of God, God is promising in His word, you're asking a line to His word, then you're asking a line to His will. It is God's word, it is God's will. You're asking a line to God's nature, God's will is expressed in who God is as nature. So uh, we shouldn't hold that. Let me pause you. Any questions? Let me check the chat. All right, let me look at it. <clears throat> um, okay, there's a question from Deepika. How do we differentiate if the doubt is in the mind or heart. Okay. So, uh, the biggest question is how can we, you know, we, we did mention a little earlier uh, that 
you know, we could have doubts in our mind, questions in our mind, how we could believe in our heart. So the question is, the biggest question is, how do we differentiate if the doubt is in the mind or the heart? I think one thing, at least what I do is, you know, we know our heart. We know what we believe, right? So uh, Romans 10, chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. With the heart, man believes. With the heart, man believes. So in your heart, there is still that conviction of God, of his word, of his promise. So if that conviction is still there, then you know that you're believing in your heart. Even though in your mind there are those doubts and there are those questions. So, is there that conviction in your heart? Is there that assurance in your heart? Is the heart settled in the word of God? So, that's one way of determining and knowing that I still believe in my heart. Even though in my mind, you know, there are those doubts that come and go. Uh, and my mind is restless but, or disturbed by those doubts but in my heart i have the confidence i have the assurance uh, i am convinced in my another important thing is jesus taught us in matthew 12 out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks so i intentionally speak what i believe in my heart that reinforces the believing in my heart and my words are then telling me this is what's in my heart. I believe God. I believe His words, even though there may be questions and doubts in my mind. So I hope those two uh, things would help there. Another question there from Krisha. Our mind always tries to find logic in everything, which makes us question our faith. How to overcome that? Now, Krisha, there is Nothing wrong in you know, using our mind, God gave our minds to us. And yes, our mind is like that. Uh, we process information, we look at things. You know, that's, that's our mind. It connects us to our the natural world. Now, what I want to point out, and, and you learn about this in your second year in, 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 our, in, in the course of Keys to supernatural. Uh, we learn about, and also you learn, you have another course on uh, inner wholeness, and I think these come in the second year. Uh, you will learn about the renewed mind. So, we all have our mind, but the Bible talks about the natural mind and the renewed mind. What is the renewed mind? The renewed mind is a mind that has been trained to think in line with the ways and thoughts of God instead of the ways and thoughts of man. So that means I'm able to switch between two levels in my mind. I'm able to walk with my natural mind, which I need to do when I face natural things, but I'm also able to switch into the renewed mind. We read about in Romans 12, verse 2, in Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, where I'm able to switch into the renewed mind level where I'm thinking according to the ways and thoughts of God. It's my same mind, but I've trained my mind to be a renewed mind. So that instead of thinking in the natural mind, I can think according to the renewed mind. Sorry, all of you are listening, man. I was looking at that. I was looking at the computer talk. You all listening, you all following, right? I was answering that question, but I'm talking to all of us. So, we will learn about this the second year. That we have our natural minds, but we have, God is calling us to walk with the renewed Romans 12, too. don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your So, as a believer, I'm actually supposed to be having or living by a renewed mind. My mind is renewed. What is the renewed mind? 
It's the mind that is able to walk according to the ways and thoughts of God. So, I'll give you an example. And you learn about this in your case to supernatural ministry class. Jesus calls his disciples and says, Let's give them something to eat. The renewed mind says, What? 5,000 people? Which bakery will give us bread for 5,000 people? That is natural mind. Then another disciple, natural mind. Lord, how much money we will need to go buy? So one disciple is calculating which bakery. <laughs> another disciple is calculating how much money. That is the natural mind. But one disciple says, Lord, I have five loaves, two fish. Let us start. So he brings my love from fish, put in the hands of Jesus. Jesus says, Tell them all to be seated. They're going to have lunch. Five loaves, two fish, five thousand people. But the renewed mind sees a miracle. The natural mind is thinking how much money. The natural mind is thinking, which bakery? The renewed mind is saying, God can multiply five loaves and So they make them all sit down. And then from the five loaves and two fish, people are fed. So that's the renewed mind. The difference between the natural mind and the renewed mind. And as believers, we must train ourselves to Think with a renewed mind. I must think in line with the ways and thoughts of God. So I hope that answers your question a little bit, Krisha. Uh, we will talk more about it in the second year. Uh, there will be two courses that cover the renewed mind. Yeah. Right. Anything else? Any other questions from here? Okay. So we we'll continue this next week. We're just talking about faith in the life of a believer. In the different areas, how, how you have, where we need to have faith. And one of the biggest emphasizes we need to faith to receive from God, to receive what God is, God is giving to us. We need faith to receive. We'll talk in more detail about how to exercise faith to receive from God. We'll talk about that in a different lesson. Now we're just giving and moving. Okay? So let's close the prayer. Um, if there are no more questions in the chat, no more questions. Okay. Let's pray. Can you see what Father Blessing is sitting here to come and pray? Pray. Pray and dismiss us. Let's right. stand in front of the camera so we can see you. Okay, pray. Thank you, Jesus, for this lady. And um, Lord, um, as we have learned today, how to as we have faith and how we use our faith and to put trust in you. We have many years of the same to improve and take to our lives and that um uh you just guide us that we're not always in we were very big in that uh you help us not to bring up the new and have to go and wait it's in you. All right. So I couldn't hear you as sometimes yeah. Okay, thank you everyone. I'll uh, see you again next week. Thanks. I have a good break before we get next week. God bless. Bye now. Bye, Rowan. Thank you. Stop this.